Neil, welcome to the GSB. Thank you for having me here. Really you. excited to have you here today as our first guest for Global Speaker Series. So as Mariel mentioned in the introduction, you have had an incredible career internationally. And over the next 40 minutes, we'd love to talk about your personal journey, both as an entrepreneur as well as an investor. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on the huge and exciting market in China today. We'll also open up the last 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Sure. So to get us started, so Neil, you grew up in China, and in 1989, you came to the US, initially for a PhD program in math, and you made the decision to do an MBA a year after that. Very validating for all the MBAs here to hear. Um, so At that time, we called it MPPM. Uh, <laughs> I was telling people that uh, this is uh, like MBA, and uh, oftentimes need a lot of explanations. Definitely. And you chose to go into banking straight after your MBA. So I'm going to take us to the year 1999. At this point, you've been in banking for eight years. You're running China capital markets for Deutsche Bank, and you're doing really well in your career. But at this point, you choose to make two pretty big decisions. One, you leave banking to start your own business, and two, you decided to move back to China. Tell us more about your thoughts behind that decision. I think I uh, can talk a little bit sort of the thoughts uh, prior to my decision to uh, go back to China Star Sea Trip. I think, you know, as someone who uh, left China um, after four years of college, you always want to do something uh, for China or around China. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, uh, upon graduation from Jiao Tong, probably the best choice for me at the time is, you know, go to US and study. But while I was in New York, I always thinking, can I do something? You know, can I leverage my China experience or background? Um, so, um, you know, 1992, 1994, there is an opportunity that you can go back to China and be part of the so-called capital markets efforts, right? You, you know, many, uh, you know, uh, students uh, who, um, who study in the U.S. or work in the U.S. before end up joining those, uh, you know, Asian branch of, you know, a big investment bank, and I'm part of them. And you get it very excited because when you go back, you see how much China has been changed from the 1980s, uh, you, know, um, you know, against the time when I left China. So you really feel like, you know, uh, there are a lot of things you can do. But back in, you know, 1994, 95, most of the so-called economic reform are around big enterprises, especially SOEs. What really actually have uh, changed is toward the end of 1990, you know, uh, you know, the 1990s, when private enterprises come to become one of the major force in the whole economic development. And so people like myself, uh, when I first uh, working in, you know, in the events and banking world in China, my major customers are the, you know, the Chinese corporates. I'm the first one knock at door at the you know, Sinok at the Bank of China. And then you're starting to find that there are opportunity to do financing for private companies. And because of that, you're thinking about whether you can be part of them. At that time, you know, entrepreneurship was not a popular word. Okay. And people like myself would say, probably I don't, you know, I don't have much opportunity you know, to do that because you need a lot of, you know, a, you know, very large amount of capital. I mean, the first batch of Chinese and you know, uh, private enterprises typically are in the area like you know, manufacturing, uh, transfer from the Shenzhen Chie, the so-called uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, those uh, uh, county uh, enterprises before, or the real estate developers and who made the first sort of um, uh, you know, their uh, gold and then you know, uh, um, bench into um, other areas. But for people like myself who has not, uh, you know, do not have a lot of capital, there's not much I, you know, um, really um, I can do until internet come to play. Uh, and I have to thank you know, US for giving me the inspiration. <laughs> I came to Silicon Valley very oftenly uh, because I have a lot of classmates while working uh, in different tech firms here. Uh, from 1998 all the way to 2000, each time when I came, I noticed the big changes because uh, many of those 
who work at Oracle, SAP, IBM, uh, you know, before has switched to internet jobs. And when I working through, you know, the, uh, you know, all those, um, uh, you know, um, drive through, uh, you know, uh, 101, you see the big billboard change from advertisement from big companies to internet companies. So you see the internet is really changing how uh, people live and work here in US. And naturally, you will think, well, if this is going to be the case in US, it should happen in China. So I have to say the first batch of you know, internet entrepreneur in China, whether it's Baidu or Tencent or C-Chip, all get inspired because these successful models in the US. And we know we can do similarly like our US counterparts. Basically, you know, not a lot of capital yourself, but you can use venture capital to help you, you know, to grow your business. So, uh, you know, my first venture, uh, C-Chip, you know, is exactly follow that, uh, you know, uh, route. You know, Expedia was doing very good, uh, and we think, well, if Expedia could be, uh, could change the travel industry so much in U.S., why not in China? So that's how I started, uh, you know, C-Chip uh, in, um, in 1999. Frankly, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, if I'm a, um, you know, software, uh, you know, engineer, it's probably a natural extension of my previous um, professions. But I was a banker, right? A uh, banker provides advice to the corporates and on, 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 you know, merge acquisitions, debt financing, IPOs, and I changed my role completely to something uh, very, very new to me, right? Um, and it was a very, very big venture for me. And the only thing I'm comfortable with is that I know if I'm not successful, I can always go back. Because if Deutsche Bank do not hire me, then someone else is going to hire me. Look back, it's actually not very good you know, mentality because when you do entrepreneurship, you better be so determined that you will make it successful, not just to hoping that one day you're going to go back. You should not leave yourself any other possibilities. But that's how, how, how I uh, you know, started. I, I do know I have possibilities. If I can be successful, and I clearly understand there, there's a good chance that I, you know, I might not, I can go back and maybe another bank can hire me. Um, but um, uh, you know, when I really get involved with a startup, you don't have time to think about anything because you want to survive and you want to do well. And every day you are just so heavily engaged with your you know, surviving uh, uh, you know, um, efforts. Indeed, I would say in the, in the first two years, you try to find your business model and you, you, know, you work day and night. You don't have time even to think about it. where's my you know, other alternatives. You don't. Yeah. I actually uh, just tell you guys uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, a little story. When I resigned from Deutsche Bank, uh, my boss, the head of Asia uh, capital market said, Neil, you should stay four more months. I said, why four more months? Because Euro is just created uh, you know, you know, uh, um, around that time. And the Euro was introduced as a major currency. I was a fixed income banker. And I have been covered Ministry of Finance of China for you know, many years. And Ministry of Finance is, has a plan to go to Euro, uh, you know, Europe to actually uh, launch its first Euro bond. So my boss told me, look, you, know, you have been covered accounts for so many years. It's your pride to actually launch a euro bond for Ministry of Finance. And this is your country. You'll be so proud of you know, uh, you know, doing that. Just wait for four months. And I checked with my partners. And they said, Neil, you can't wait for four months. Entrepreneurship is about speed. Another four months, you don't know what's going to happen. So I decided to quit in November, December, instead of wait until the, you know, that uh, you know, spring in 2000. Interestingly. I, was, I never regret that decision because that euro bond was not launched until year 2003. Euro was not doing well, as you guys all know, right? And the euro coming down, and the Ministry of Finance said, no, 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 I don't want to do it. So they wait until 2002, uh, 2003 to actually launch the euro bond. So I go back to tell my boss, later become an independent director of C-Trip. I said, look, if I wait for four years, four months, I'm going to wait for another 10 months and maybe two years, and there'll never be a C-Trip. 
So if you like to do something, and if you really feel like you know, there's something calling you inside, you better do it right away. And that's about, all about entrepreneurship. So while you said that you, know, you could always go back to banking if you weren't doing well, or well, you were doing very well with Citrip, you started in 1999, and just four years you know, before the Euro bond was launched, you brought it public, listed on NASDAQ. And what's amazing is that's not even the only company you found that's successful in that period. In 2002, you found that Home Inns, now one of the largest hotel chains in China. You're in more than 300 cities, close to 3,000 hotel chains, and also four years listed on NASDAQ. How do you do it? You know, what do you think has contributed to your success as an entrepreneur? I think it's um, you know, very importantly that uh, once you get into the business, um, you are able to uh, really uh, understand that sector very well uh, instead of just looking at your own business and say, you know, I'm, I'm doing my daily execution. So at a sea trip, it's really a very eye-open uh, opportunity for me for the whole hospitality industry. You realize, oh, the Chinese travel agency are so backward in terms of the IT systems. And there's so much middleman involved in bringing a customer, whether it's business or leisure, to the ultimate destinations. There's so much you can do. Obviously, as a company, you can't just want just one issue. But you do uh, you know, uh, get to know a lot about the whole you know, uh, industry. One thing we, which, which we noticed when I, I, you know, I'm working um, at a sea trip is our uh, upstream, so-called you know, the hotel industry itself, is again, is very, very underdeveloped. For example, there's many um, uh, so-called uh, you know, uh, business hotel uh, or economy hotel chains in the US. But in China, back in 2002 and 2003, there's almost none. Uh, in the, uh, and and uh, it, it actually shocks me that there's no such hotel which catering to a specific needs. And when we launched Home Inns, I initially I was a little bit concerned how big a company could be, because um, you know each hotel is is small, 100 rooms, 150 rooms, and how big a company this could you know um, um, become, or whether China is ready. But again, I got inspiration from you, you know uh, U.S. I remember I was in um, uh, you know um, um, Dallas visiting a few uh, travel service company because that was the hub of many uh, US uh, uh, you know, travel uh, you know, service companies. And I arrived at the airport, I rent a car, drive from the airport all the way to downtown. It was like nighttime around 9 p.m., whatever. And during that 20 to 30 minutes drive, I observed there's about 15 names, you know, different names of budget hotels or economy hotel chain from Red Roof all the way to Motel 6, whatever. And the total number of hotels I counted, around 25. So from Dallas, from suburban airport to the city, you can have 25 hotels. So I say, well, market size is not a problem for China now. <laughs> <laughs> but indeed, I never imagined we can have 3,000 hotels in China uh, you know, by all means. And this is all created. Uh, by you know, our efforts and as well as obviously our, many of our competitors. And the market is definitely there because the, the demand is so big. And we just need to create a good product to cater to the users. So you made quite a few transitions going from a PhD to an MBA and then banking to entrepreneurship. In 2005, you make yet another big decision going from being an entrepreneur to becoming the entrepreneur behind entrepreneurs. And What's really interesting is you could have chosen to start your own fund, which I'm sure you had plenty of resources to do, but instead you decided to be a franchise firm with Sequoia Capital, this really well-established American brand. What were some of these considerations behind bringing this global brand to China? Well, I think, you know, first of all, um, you know, if you look at you know, my career from, yeah, from PhD program, I never get a PhD to MBAs, or not, not MBA, MPPMs, and to banking, etc. I don't think we have many choice back then. And this is something which you guys, you know, uh, you know, um, you know compare with uh, us, you guys are so lucky. I'm talking about, you know, you know especially those uh, uh, public students from China. Because, you know, when I, 
you know, arrive in New York, uh, I don't think I can get into business school right away. And, and, and again, after business school, you, you know, you don't have many choices either. Um, and oftentimes, you, you're never going through internship or prior working experience, so it can tell you what's your best fit for you. Um, but what actually um, drives me to make those choices is that you see the great opportunity. And also, you go with the whole trend. And the, the last 20, 30 years, the big trend is that you think that China is going to become um, you know, a, a, a global economy, a powerhouse. And if you believe in that, and you know, in a, a, uh, you know, a poker uh, a term you call it, if you are all in China, you are largely doing well. And I guess that's probably going to be the case for the next 10, 20 years. If you, you know, so-called uh, Kando, or if you belong China, or even more so, you are, you know, you know, all in China, you're likely to do well. And coming back to um, uh, doing, um, you know, venture capital, I always think that probably the best fit for me after spending you know, seven years as a banker and then another six years as an entrepreneur is get into uh, an investment field because you can leverage your experience. Uh, both as a financier as well as as an entrepreneur, so that's something which I think probably fit me very well. Clearly, I never planned that. I never get in the bank and say, "Hey, one day I do some entrepreneurship, and then I can best fit myself for as a, as a venture capitalist." I, you know, I never do that. Same when I start a C trip, I always want to survive and and, and make C trip a great company. Never think that okay, this experience can position myself. Be a good entry, you know. Be a good uh, venture capitalist, you know, uh, sometime down the road. Now, um, I, I I can do a fund myself. Indeed, I make some personal investment while at uh, you know C trip, and some of those are very successful, like Fox Media, E House. But I was thinking, how I can sort of best leverage my experience at the same time can really make an investment and have a big impact uh, on the whole. Uh, you know, uh, so-called uh, new economy. Um, <clears throat> you can you can set up you know a um, a fund myself, uh, but I think uh, it's going to be grow a or probably not as fast uh, compared with you know setting up something with Sequoia. And also, I feel like I really want to learn from what uh, a firm like Sequoia has been uh, you know um, uh, you know accumulated in the last forty years. Um, uh, you know. Um, in Silicon Valley, there's many firms has been active in you know the investment space, but Sequoia has been obviously the you know they're you know the longest and still probably the best, or if not you know uh, a, or I would say at least one of the best. So I was very intrigued how they can do that one generation after another. So um, to me, uh, to raise money to make investment is probably not the most difficult thing, but the most you know. Um, Sort of challenging things: how to make a sustainable business. To me, I think you know Sequoia China is a, just a, you know um, another venture. If you want to make one or two you know good investment, that's an easy job. But how you can build a team and how to make a sustainable business, just like what I did at Ctrip, I think that's a very very different thing. And and you know today I look back after ten years, I'm very happy you know the choice I made because you know. Um, at our 10-year um, anniversary, we have a long list of entrepreneurs which become Sequoia portfolio uh, CEOs. But more importantly, uh, from 10 years ago, uh, a three-person, four-person uh, team, today we have 12 partners, and we have covered some of the most important sectors in China and become investors in many of the leading companies. And that's something which is probably difficult to achieve just with one man's efforts or with Neoshin brands. So on that topic, you know, Sequoia Capital in China for the last 10 years has a phenomenal track record. It's pretty much put money in all of China's biggest unicorns, Alibaba, JD.com, VIP shop. You know, people call you China's Midas. You turn stone into gold. Um, what do you think makes you so successful as an investor, especially in China? What's your secret sauce? Well, I think, you know, this um, venture capital investment is a um, is a you know um, is a is a profession always has regret. Clearly, we have a lot of uh, very successful co you know companies, but obviously we also have a lot of regret. 
and, and frankly, you know, mistakes. And the good thing is you learn from your mistakes. Um, and then you try to improve every year. The other thing very, very important is when you look at the Sequoia US, they have fully you know, history. They have a long list of success. Oracle, uh, you know, uh, 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 <coughs> Cisco, uh, Apple, and then Google, and you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the reasons behind that is they're able to capture all the major trends. And they are able to say no to some uh, trend which turned out to be is uh, just pure um, 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 illusions. And, and that's, I think, is, is the probably most important factors behind you know, the success of firms like Sequoia. And same for us um, in China. If there's any so-called success for us, then that's, uh, you know, uh, I think we have been really taking, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the major uh, trend right. I, I remember back seven years ago, we have decided that we should spend enough time and put enough of our uh, uh, investment into e-commerce area. We do have a view that e-commerce be will become very, very important in China, probably even more important uh, compared with, you know, uh, um, in, uh, you know, the um, retail space in the U.S. So we invest probably around 15 e-commerce companies in China. Some of those are not successful, but we did capture the top five to six uh, you know, very successful uh, e-commerce in China. Same for O2O. Offline to online is not a big space in the US, but it was a big state, and it continued to be a very important space for China. We think this is a, you know, a, you know, um, um, uh, you know, a, a, um, a very important area for us. And we did a lot of research back four or five years ago. We invest probably around, again, 12 to 15 companies. And we happen to capture the very top four companies, you know, from Meituan to Dianping to Erlema to Dada. And, and that's the way I think, you know, um, uh, I think probably, you know, good firms should make investment. You, you actually have a view on the market and hopefully a little bit earlier than you know, most other people. And you put big emphasis on the sectors and making multiple investment in that, you know, um, in, in that sectors. And this is the same for you know, um, US. If you look um, at Sequoia, back in 40 years ago, they paid big attention to uh, you know, um, semiconductors. And then semiconductor uh, you know, leads to personal computer. And they again invest multiple company in personal computer, and then to pers and, and, and and then to software companies, and then when internet you know comes become you know the major theme, they invest multiple internet companies, uh, and then go into you know um, mobile internet. That is the way I think you know uh, uh, you know a, a good investor should follow. Um, there's nothing you know um, you know um, match about it. There's always something which you will miss, uh, you know because of because of judgment on person, you know, or, or judgment on a particular business model, but that's okay. You always, always will make mistake, but you, as long as you capture all the major trends, you'll be doing very, very fine. Uh, and sometimes it, it, it will including to say no to some sectors. I remember uh, seven, eight years ago, clean tech is a buzzword, both here in the US as well as in China, and luckily, uh, our US partners as well as our China partners decided this is not a big area, you know. Uh, fundamentally, it's not easy to create large market caps uh, by investing uh, in venture capital or even private equities into the sectors. Indeed, after 10 years, anyone can remember like what are the top, you know, multi-billion dollar company out of the space? Nothing, right? Uh, and avoid those sort of pitfalls is again very, very important because there are certain firms spend one third of, of their time and money into the space. And they end up finding this is actually not much there. Um, and, and this is, uh, you know, and, and, uh, you know and, and I think this is probably the most important, uh, uh, you know, uh, efforts and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, um, and judgmental calls. Um, coming on to um, companies, you always will make mistakes. I remember um, when we look at, you know, um, the um, video space back nine, you know, um, nine years ago. We actually like the space, 
Um, and we actually put a lot of efforts on it. And US Sequoia has invested um, in, U um, in YouTube, very successful. We picked the number three player in that space uh, and end up, uh, it's just a small game for us. And these things will happen all the time because uh, you, know, you may not be you know, uh, do all right for judging a, a particular entrepreneur. Uh, in that particular case, the company's founder was not very good at marketing and happened to be that the marketing is the key efforts for a video sharing companies. And, and uh, sometimes you get lucky, like you know, in our case, VIP Shop or JD or you know, uh, recent case like a Meituan, Dianping. But um, the big trend is a lot more important to calling right on one particular company. So what do you think are some of these major trends going forward? What excites you about China today? I think uh, you know, uh, every couple of years, there's always some technology breakthroughs. And the last five years in the US, the big theme is big data, SaaS enterprises. And it's not a big thing in China yet, but I think it's becoming increasingly important. Uh, in fact, I would think the, uh, you know, the returnees from this part of the world, especially from Silicon Valley, might have a better role to play uh, in China if you talk about big data and SaaS and enterprises. China, in, you know, in this time, is like US five, six years ago, when you come down to enterprises, software, SaaS enterprises, uh, SaaS and, and big data. So I think this is actually a great opportunity. Um, and just like when you, 1999, there's many uh, big internet company in US being founded. China, you know, there's very few areas have been covered. And this is uh, very much comparable. And when you come down to um, uh, um, the, for the um, returnees to go back to uh, a founding company, I think this is actually a very good area. Because um, if you talk about consumer internet, you may not be able to compete successfully against so-called you know, the local guy. Because in the consumer internet space, uh, the culture factor is so heavy. You have to understand your user very well. If you work in the US for too long, you may not be able to do that. If you look at a, you know, like uh, Charles Zhang, and if you look at Robin Lee, when they go back to China, they don't really have a very long working experience here in the US. They are not like you know, an early employee of Yahoo or you know, early employee of Google to go back to founding Chinese companies. But in the enterprise area, the technology component is more important. So people who work here for many years in that space could actually play a very important role. Uh, in shaping up the space in China. So I think this is definitely uh, you know, a very important area. Uh, the other important area is uh, so-called uh, you know, robotics or artificial AI areas. Again, in that area, there are many US companies uh, uh, ahead of you know, um, China. But China started to see some local uh, born companies which had developing its own technology. Company like DJI, right? You know, it definitely the number one player in the drone space. And so, so I think we, we probably see uh, some in, you know, interesting dynamics. Even the, you know, some of the Chinese company will you know, doing better than some of the you know, um, US company addressing those uh, you know, major trends. Uh, but you know, uh, just like what we've seen before, every couple of years there's new technology breakthrough and bringing new, you know, um, commercial opportunity. But relatively speaking, I think China's opportunity might be bigger compared with the US because, because the, you know, the uh, so-called uh, um, uh, uh, um, 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 efficiency in the traditional industry is well behind uh, compared with uh, uh, US. That's why e-commerce could do so well um, in uh, you know, uh, China compared with the US. And same for O2Os. So while we're on the topic of you know, American companies in China, China is a huge market, growing second largest economy in the world. And Sequoia China has actually also been working with a lot of these American companies. You've invested in LinkedIn, you're a strategic partner with Airbnb. So for you, what do you think are some of these biggest opportunities and especially challenges for American companies entering China? And what's Sequoia's role in helping them navigate this? 
If you're looking at um, global companies, especially U.S. company coming to China, um, I think in the first 30 years, 40 years, when China opened door, uh, many U.S. companies have been very successful because the technology is so advanced that they, when they come to China, there's no competitions. Like when GM comes to China, people love it, even though GM may not be the best you know, mobile com or, or, or automobile company in the world. Right? And there's a lot of joint venture gets set up. So at that time, uh, you know, the key word in the joint venture is use technology to gain market share. Right? So whether it's European players or American players, oftentimes uh, set up their uh, own subsidiaries or set up a joint venture in China. And they could do very well against the competition, uh, either against the private company or against the state-owned enterprises. But things have been really changed. Many sectors today, the private companies in China and state-owned enterprises in China are very competitive. They have learned, they have developed in their own R&D, uh, and they can really compete very effectively with you. Right? When PNG goes to China, when GM goes to China back 30 years ago, they dominate certain space. Today, they have to compete uh, fiercely with many local players. So one of the idea here is that if, the if a US company comes to China, just copy what they have been done in US, it may not be that effective anymore. So you have to have to change your model and your, you know, um, your product to cater to China's model, you know, um, very unique uh, you know, um, um, business environment, especially in the internet space, because internet, uh, for internet, China and US start around the same time. Um, for some business model, China even are advanced compared with the US. For example, Tencent you know, today clearly much better than you know, some of those uh, social network companies in China. You can't say Tencent is learn from uh, you know, Facebook or copycat Facebook. In fact, if you look at Facebook and you know, many others, some of those features are learned from Chinese companies. So if a internet company in the US want to go to China, they have to think about whether they have an edge there or not. Secondly, they're going to have to face the competition from local companies, many driven by very, very strong entrepreneurs. So how are you going to be successful? One thing which we suggest is to having a very unique uh, shareholding structures. You should introduce someone as entrepreneur as in your home country. Someone not listen to the head office, but someone able to uh, base uh, his product and service around Chinese unique business you know, um, environment and leverage the edge from head office. That's how we did it on you know, the LinkedIn joint ventures. And that's what I why, you know, I'll try very, uh, try very hard for Airbnb. The product of, of LinkedIn and Airbnb are wonderful. There's no question about it. But there are some local competitors. Their CEOs and their founders are very strong. And you need to have a structure where the guy who run LinkedIn China has a direct interest in running that business. So the management team need to be compensated properly and not just compensate at the head office. And I, I think that, you know, that's probably the best way for a uh, you know, US company to, you know, to compete and do well in China. In fact, if a Chinese company comes to Silicon Valley, they should do the same thing, right? If, if they send something from, you know, someone from head office and try, try to compete with local company here in, in, in US, I don't think they have a chance, but they have to hire the best talent in Silicon Valley and give them the enough economic interest. Let them run the show, and then leverage the back end from China. And then you might have a chance to compete in locally. That's, I think, it, it is the model moving forward, applicable for both US company as well for Chinese companies. So that's how we actually bring Link into China, and that's how we bring Airbnb China. And I think this is probably a model uh, that will you know, see if that's a fit for many uh, other U.S. companies, even though they are already very, very successful here in the in, uh, um, U.S. And as the business partner, what we bring to the table is that we're helping to uh, um, get the best team. Uh, 
and, and also to put all resources behind it and to make sure that you have the right partners uh, for your efforts. And, and actually, it's, very, it's, it's not easy to find such so-called uh, local CEOs because he needs to be very entrepreneurial, as I mentioned. At the same time, he had to understand how to work in with a large organization because you, ha you do want to leverage your head office, some of, you know, some of the existing technology um, infrastructures, and someone who know how to make sure you know, the, res the respective um, department within your head office can work with you very closely. So it's difficult to find this type of talent, but you know, and and uh, and it, it, um, it's it, it's um, it's a tough job, and we have been trying very hard, and uh, so far that uh, we have been quite successful with LinkedIn, and hopefully we can extend it to um, um, to um, other U.S. companies. Definitely want to stay in Airbnbs in China. So we'll now open up to questions from the audience. We have Maria and Neve on either side. Please raise your hand high if you are interested in asking the question so they can spot you. You can also tweet to our hashtag SanfordGSS if you have a question. And I think we'll start with a question from Twitter. Great, so thank you both for such an inspirational discussion. Um, now, the first question from Twitter, many of us here um, aspire to be entrepreneurs and see China as a great market opportunity. But what are some of the unique challenges that entrepreneurs face in China and how do you recommend we overcome them? I think uh, one of the most frequently uh, uh, sort of encountered challenge is competition. Uh, it's, it's actually interesting. I always very puzzled, and I still do not have the perfect answer. Here in the US, in Silicon Valley, have one business model. Typically, no one either cares to, you know, to you know, copy, or no one really you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, need to copy. Uh, if you you know you have Uber, you have Airbnb, you have Linkedin. There's very few copycats. Uh, in China, as long as your business is doing well, you will definitely have copycats. <laughs> uh, it's a matter of how to compete more successfully, and um, um, and and that actually gonna put in pressure on the leaders to innovate all the time. Right? I remember when I was running C trip, one of the um, my routine job is come to Monday meeting and discuss how our competitor was doing, especially Elon, right? So one of the, one of, one of the Monday discussion item is you know, spending 30 minutes uh, and discuss what Elon has been launched in the last one week. And indeed, I have to say, you know, many of those are copied what c has been doing. Um, some of the very detailed, like you know, marketing plans, uh, like sending cards at the airport. When we do that, they did that. So what what can you do, right? So you just have to innovate all the time, just to make sure you stay ahead of the game. And it's a reality, and people have to face many business models. You cannot IP it, um, and and uh, you just have to uh, you know uh, you know raise more money. You just have to you know, innovate all the time, and you, and, and you just have to um, differentiate yourself well enough. And that differentiation sometimes comes down to very details. Uh, when we look at c versus Elon, uh, at that time, uh, we are around two times bigger than Elon. And one of the differentiate we have is through call center, we're providing better services. That's actually become a, a, a big edge. And if you're coming down to merchant relationship, uh, when we establish a certain relationship with you know, um, a hotel group, they follow. Uh, you know, that relationship, you know, it's, it's difficult to do a, a, you know, um, exclusive deals. But only thing which we have been done well and defend yourself is a better customer services. And, and, so, and, and you can call that actually a small details, but that small detail really bring a uh, you know, very big change uh, you know, uh, be, uh, be bring very big, uh, big gap uh, for C chip against Elon. And so for China, if you want to get into those competitive space, you have to uh, be prepared and to innovate all the times. And, and the other thing I want to probably point out is that it's uh, uh, difficult to retain talents in Silicon Valley because people are going to strike out on his own. It's even more difficult to do so in China. If you're looking at a turnover rate at the major internet companies uh, in China, it's actually higher, a lot higher compared with US companies. 
uh, many companies feel like, uh, you know, sorry, many senior executives feel like, uh, you know, to do startup today, uh, you know, the environment is so good. There's so many people, you know, uh, you know, so much money, you know, a chase after them. And they all, and, and especially in the mobile internet space, the entry barrier to start up something is, very, you know, is relatively lower. So we do see people willing to consider uh, do something on his own instead of staying with a large company. And so I think that's a challenge that how to retain people. And uh, obviously, you know, compensation is, is, is one way, ESOP, um, um, et cetera. But also to build a very strong culture to make sure that you know, your top people could stay. Thank you for sharing with us. I'm Taobing, uh, MBA one. So I'm really curious to see how you can evaluate a company with a trend that is kind of uncertain. So earlier you mentioned that big data is one of the trends. And within big data, there's gonna be a lot of different sectors, yeah. medicine, education, you name it. Can you maybe walk through us, share some insights on how you would actually have a quantifiable metrics within those big data sectors to determine which one would be potentially successful? I think uh, there's a few common uh, sort of uh, uh, checking point we will you know, look at when we're looking at any um, of, you know, startup. This is the same whether it's consumer internet or whether it's SaaS enterprise. One is obviously the, you know, the background of the team, whether it actually fit for that type of uh, you know, um, entrepreneurship. For example, if it's e-commerce, I'll be very you know, uh, e eager to know whether he has uh, consumer retail experience, whether he has supply chain experience. But for SaaS enterprises, I will look to see if he has you know, the relevant software experience or enterprises uh, experience you know, um, before. Secondly, I will also look at the market size. That's actually very, very important. If you look at e-commerce area, uh, you know, um, the reason why JD become you know, one of the top internet companies in China, because they just you know, the most important area, you know, at the very beginning, the 3C, the consumer, you know, um, um, the consumer e e electronics. Uh, if you start some, some, from something else, for example, you focus on books day one, then you may not get as big as you grow. Uh, so the, uh, you know, total adjustable market is always, always something, you know, very, very important, especially in the first one to two years. You can always expand from your core areas after you become successful. Um, so in the SaaS enterprise area, um, you have to start from some verticals. And the question is whether that vertical is big enough for you to become a very substantial leader and you can expand from that. Beyond these two points, uh, the other very important, uh, I think, uh, uh, area to look after is whether the time is right. Because enterprises demand uh, in China is clearly there, but people have priorities. For particular corporates, they'll look at it, how much you know, money I want to spend on, and, on the enterprise software, and what are the key you know, sort of area I want to put money this year against a year later or two years later. So for enterprise software, uh, you should look at those areas which corporate are having the most pain in increasing efficiency. Uh, we look at uh, securities, we look at storage, we look at performance areas, uh, we look at uh, HR areas, some of those areas which clearly, with the rising labor cost, you have to address in those issues. And I think this is probably uh, a important point for venture capitalists as well as for, you know, for an entrepreneur who wants to start business in that sector. Thank you, Mr. Shen, for your um, speeches. It's very inspiring. So my question is about people. When you was about to start Citrip, how did you find your partners? Because without good partners, it's impossible for a startup to be successful. And the same as here, like now if we want to build up a startup in China, how, what's the most effective way to find the perfect partners? Thank you. It's difficult to find perfect partners, but as long as you find good partners, that's okay. Uh, when I look at many startups, uh, when they walked into our conference, you know, conference room to present, you know, to be honest, most of the team at the so-called angel stage or series stage do not have a complete team. But you need to have some core team member and addressing the major uh, needs. Uh, you know, 
in, in a sea of days, we have myself and James and Chi Chi. Frankly, it's a little bit crowded team, right? We got three guys already have a lot of experience in different business segments. Um, but even with that three people, we decided to find Fanmin, who has worked at the travel industry for many years. Uh, because we do realize uh, online travel is about internet, but at the same time, it's about travel. So we want someone who understands the travel industry a lot, about you know, how to build a relationship with hotels, how to uh, you know, position ourselves against you know, all the other traditional travel agencies. So these are very interesting questions that you have to address. And you find someone who can complement your skill set and to addressing those issues. And if you're going to have a so-called core team at first, not a complete team, then try to find what are the most critical component of your startup, like e-commerce. Then you have to better have someone who understand supply chain. If you, know, if you do not have someone experienced in that segment, you don't even have the business taking off. But maybe someone who uh, you know, do a better job to, you know, doing online marketing comes second. Uh, it's still very important, but it's not the most critical at the day one. Uh, so I think you, know, you, you just have to go along with your, uh, you know, your, your, your business you know, uh, ramp up to find a team gradually. Day one to find a complete team is always a challenge. I think we have time for one last question okay. from the audience. Hello. Hi, Neil. Uh, thanks for your time. My question is, uh, which is a bigger bubble, China or Silicon Valley? Uh, I want to be more, I actually want to be more specific. So here's a thought experiment. If uh, Uber raises another round right now, um, and uh, if the last, latest round investors are guaranteed a three times return, would you be an investor? Thanks. I don't want to comment specifically on the Uber <laughs> case, but I don't see a um, so-called a big bubble there because at the end of the day, you ask yourself, are those startups really creating values? If they do creating values, uh, or, or most of the startup companies are creating values, I'm not particularly worried. Valuation, there's always uh, up and downs. If you look at a public market, they're always up and downs anyway. And so I would not particularly worry about you know, valuation itself, because the market itself will adjust. The venture capitalists, in general, are not stupid enough to pay a premium consistently. They might pay premium for a short period of time, but they will adjust themselves. And when you look at the so-called uh, um, you know, bubble, um, if most of company are just creating a lot of uh, you know, so-called users without providing value to users, that's something which I worry. But if you look at Uber and Airbnb, right? I mean, clearly these are the two, one of the you know two of, of the you know startup or company which which become very successful. They do creating a lot of values, right? I mean, Uber clearly has uh, provide you know the most efficiency, mo most efficient uh, transportation uh, you know you know systems for all the people around the world, and Airbnb has creating new demands. And something which the hotel industry and have never been, you know, uh, you know, thought about. So I think these are either creating new demand or increase e efficiency big time. So I think ultimately, you know, the value will be, you know, uh, created by those companies. I'm not particularly worried that if there's any so-called, you know, bubble because the company might ahead of itself a little bit for valuations. Uh, if you look at, you know, China uh, back in. Um, you know, 1999, where there's a you know, bunch of companies like C Trip, uh, like you know, uh, Baidu. It's difficult to comment on the valuation at each stage. But what is important is that they do bring value to the companies, uh, to, uh, to the whole uh, you know, um, economy. What, uh, what I'll be very worried about is when those companies are creating a very thin value. I want to uh, raise, uh, uh, you know, uh, use one, uh, uh, you know, um, um, examples. Back in 2001 and 2002, there's a bunch of company called uh, SP companies in China. I don't know if you guys still remember. Uh, maybe you, you know, some of those, you are not living in China at the time. They're providing either link tones or pictures for the China Mobile, China Unicom, um, et cetera. And most of the company had died or had been sold. And sold itself is, is not an issue. The issue is when they, you know, the company sold, 
the company almost disappear. It's not like YouTube or Instagram, they're there and they provide value to users. Why those companies disappeared? And at one point, they're very, very profitable because they charge a part of the, you know, um, uh, you know they, um, they, ch ch uh, they charge user fees through China Mobile and China Unicom. And it could be very, very profitable because the value creating is just so thin. People do not need that middleman. China Mobile can do it themselves after they fit out. So that's why I was well recorded. That's the real bubble. If you talk about you know, the bubble in the last 10, 15 years in China, those SP company as a whole is a bubble. And if we can avoid that, I, I think the, you know, the overall startup environment is really, really healthy. Great, well, before we end, Neil, one last question. So as a really successful entrepreneur yourself and now being the entrepreneur behind entrepreneurs, what advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs here in the audience as they look to build something new? I think you, know, you have to go with your heart. <laughs> you know, it's, it's difficult to uh, make a perfect choice. Um, and uh, at least in my cases, uh, um, that each time when I make a choice, I say, one, whether this go with a big trend. Secondly, probably more important, which is something you really like it to do, right? When I um, uh, you know, was working at a Deutsche Bank in, in the last you know, sort of uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, a year or so in, in, 1990, in, in, uh, in, in 1999, I really, really was excited by you know, the internet development in China. I really want to do something. If I'm, gonna do, if I'm not going to do C-Chip, I will do something else. But C-Chip itself, fits me well because I love travel. At the same time, I think the internet can change uh, you know, uh, people's life in China. So you have to really love um, what you do. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to sustain. Uh, you know, uh, if you just think this is just a big trend, but that's something which you don't like, or, or you don't know whether you like it or not, then if you work there for like you know, six months and 12 months, you'll probably feel like, oh, I want to jump to the next trend. I do. Notice there are some entrepreneurs like that. You know, I was, uh, you, know, um, you know, we had this Monday meeting, and then you know, when some entrepreneur come to visit and ask him, so why do you want to do, say, you know, do this entrepreneurship? Oh, B2B is, is hot, or big data is hot. But the question fundamentally is, do you think you are the best fit for this, and do you really have passion for that? And that's you know, a question you should ask yourself. And no matter what other people's interests, you should find your interest and follow your heart and find the stuff you are passionate about it and do it. All right, thank, thank you, you so much, Neil. Real pleasure having you here today. <laughs>